In the last video about the peristernal short axis view, we did have a look specifically on the aortic valve, how to get the peristernal short axis view in the first place. And we did evaluate the tricuspid and the pulmonic valve as well as the pulmonic trunk and the pulmonary arteries. In the last video, we did stop in the evaluation of the mitral valve. And now we dig deeper into the topic of the mitral valve. Well, the mitral valve is very complicated. First of all, it has an anterior and a posterior leaflet. These are divided into three parts, A1, so the anterior leaflet part 1, A2, A3, and the posterior leaflet P3, P2, P1. As we can see in all these views, this is an apical long axis, an apical 2 chamber, an apical 4 chamber view, we can always see parts of the separate leaflets of the mitral valve, but in the person short axis, you can see the entire mitral valve and all the leaflets with all the parts. So this is the posterior media commissure, the anterolateral lateral commissure. And here you can see you count it with A3, A2, A1, P3, P2, P1. So in the peristernal short axis view, you get an overview of the entire mitral valve and you can probably see where, for example, mitral regurgitation is originating. Furthermore, you can measure in the peristernal short axis the opening of the mitral valve in case of mitral stenosis. How does it look like in a pathological example? Here we have a peristernal short axis view focused on the mitral valve again. This is the posterior medial and this is the anterior lateral commissure the anterior mitral valve leaflet and the posterior mitral valve leaflet. And you see that the left ventricle is thickened. The ventricular function, at least from the radial perspective, is preserved. We do see parts of the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve as well. So now let's review our leaflets. So here we have the anterior, the posterior leaflet, anterior and posterior leaflet, A3 and P3, A2 and P2, and A1 and P1. Now we do see that the mitral valve looks a bit off probably, but we need to add color Doppler information. And with the help of color Doppler, we do see that there's truly a problem with the mitral valve. We do see mitral regurgitation. So this jet over here, there's turbulent flow, and this is the regurgitant jet you can already appreciate in this view. Well, most importantly, in this specific view, you see that the origin of the jet is in the P2 segment, most likely. So this is P2, this is A2. Here we have P3, P1. And here in the center of the valve, the regurgitation jet, which is eccentric, is present. The next view we have to talk about is the so-called papillary muscle view. Why is this important? Well, you can tilt, as I did explain in the previous video, from the aortic valve to the mitral valve, until the apex to evaluate the left ventricle. And in this case, we have another view of the left ventricle with the posterior medial and the anterolateral papillary muscle. And we do see the cavity of the left ventricle. This is if you just initially see parts of the mitral valve, and then we arrive at the level of the papillary muscle where you see this nice round left ventricle with normal left ventricular function. To repeat, this is the posterior medial and this is the anterolateral papillary muscle. Also focus on the pericardium over here. Sometimes you can see pericardial effusion. We are not done in the peristernal short axis. We have to continue with the apical view. So when you tilt even further from the papillary muscle view, you will arrive in the apical regions of the left ventricle. If you cannot do it by simply tilting, move one intercostal space downwards. So if you did stay in the third intercostal space, move to the fourth intercostal space. And with tilting, you will most likely reach the apical region then. How does it look like in a B-mode image? Here you can see the round left ventricle. We lose the papillary muscles and we arrive at the apical regions of the left ventricle. All those views, they are very important to see if left ventricular function is normal, preserved or reduced, even severely reduced, you can evaluate in these views. Also, you can see wall motion abnormalities 
in case of, for example, coronary artery disease or myocardial infarction. Furthermore, again, note this bright hyperechoic line, that's the pericardium. In this case, we have normal radial and circumferential left ventricular function and a normal left ventricle. So now let's have a look at all the different cut planes we can have with the peristernal short axis. We start at the level of the aortic valve seen over here. That's the aortic valve. Then we continue with the level of the mitral valve seen here. So this is the level of the aortic valve, the level of the mitral valve. Here you see the aortic valve here, the mitral valve level. The level of the papillary muscles here, you can see an example where the papillary muscles are thickened and left ventricular myocardium is also thickened. And we continue even to the apical regions. Here you can see an example where this is a very important view. You see some hypertrabeculations in the apical region. This is a rare cardiomyopathy. In this view, you can already get a glimpse that the apical region have extended trabeculation, so this spongy appearance. To summarize, what are the views and how you have to tilt and turn and rotate the transducer? Well, we start with the peristernal short axis view. With the peristernal short axis view at the aortic valve, where we have the aortic valve in the center, where we see the right coronary cusp, the left coronary cusp, and the non-coronary cusp, we continue to evaluate the pulmonic trunk and the tricuspid valve, if you also want to include that view. Here we see the pulmonic trunk, the RVOT and the pulmonic valve, the right and the left pulmonary artery. We furthermore tilt the transducer down to the level of the mitral valve with the anterior and the posterior mitral valve leaflet, the P3, P2, P1, A3, A2, and the one segments of the mitral valve and continuing from this view, we can tilt the transducer even downwards to see the papillary muscle, the posterior medial, and the anterolateral, as well as the interventricular septum is here as well. And here still parts of the right ventricle. And to even tilt further down, we do see the LV apex. Why do we need so many views? Well, in this case, in the peristernal short axis view, the whole left ventricle is displayed. You start at the basis and you can scan until the apex. So you can see radial, but also circumferential function of the left ventricle. Furthermore, you can evaluate global function and wall motion abnormalities. Is it preserved? Are there akinetic or hypokinetic areas? You can see if the ventricle is hypertrophied or the left ventricular walls are thickened. You can also get a glimpse at the right ventricle and function and morphology of the right ventricle as well. You can see the dimensions both of the left and the right ventricle. You can also see if there is right ventricular volume or pressure overload with signs of the left ventricle, the so-called D sign. You will see that in another video I'm going to present to you and you can see all the valves basically. You can see the aortic valve in the beginning, the pulmonic valve, the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve with the mitral valve. You can do the planimetry to quantify mitral stenosis but you can also evaluate where the origin or the possible origin of mitral regurgitation is located if there is a defect of the mitral valve and of course in the apical regions you can detect even a thrombus or as I have shown you an example of a non-compaction cardiomyopathy, where thrombus formation is also very important. This concludes the second part of the chapter of the normal anatomy of the peristernal short axis view. But we are not done yet with the peristernal short axis. We do have pathologies to discuss.